Hi, I'm Miss Malini, and today I have the pleasure of interviewing Mr. Rulani Skruella. I'm a big fan. I'm also like a young entrepreneur, so everything that you've done has been very inspiring. And now you've written a book. Is this your first book? Yeah, it's my first book. It's a book, I think I've written it for a particular purpose, so I can't comment whether it's my last book or <laughs> but it definitely is my first book. Yeah. So as they say, you know, everyone who has uh, had so many experiences like you've had, and I was, you know, reading about you when you grew up with like in a lower middle class family and you know, you worked your way up. And they say everyone has a story in them. So what made you decide to write it now? What, what was that? I think it was an interesting crossroad. I sort of was exiting media and entertainment. It was a time for me to figure out my second innings, whether it's going to be 20 years or two hours. <laughs> I, I, I was pretty clear my second innings were going to be the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and at that time, I met a lot of people. I, I just, for the first six months, was meeting a lot of people. And it came home to me that what I think I did 20 years back, I was beginning to start doing it all over again from scratch for my next 20 years. Right. And that's when I realized how much, how much or how little have things changed over the last 20 years. So I think that was my trigger for saying maybe I should bend this down and share because I really found that there isn't that kind of strong pride and enthusiasm for entrepreneurship in yeah. this country as people perceive it to be. For sure. And so what was it like for you when you started and, and you started your career? Tough. I think those those 20 years back, entrepreneurship was a word, I think, very bad. Word. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't think it was a bad word, but it was a word people found it almost difficult to pronounce, I would right, say. Right, it's true. Uh, there wasn't really an ecosystem for funding and everything else, so whatever you did, you were on your own. Yeah. I think the, the parental pressure that you had to get yourself a good job and job security in India sure. was very, very strong. Yeah. So I think you needed to be very strong will and hugely confident to then embark on your own. I love that. So I love that it's called Dream With Your Eyes Open. And someone actually tweeted it uh, very sweetly. It says saying that it sounds like advocacy for virtual reality. <laughs> and so maybe the next, yeah. next book you My might next be book I'll be doing gamification of the book. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, so that was a comment in from Utkarsh on Twitter. Right. And a, a lot of questions came in on Twitter when I said that I'm coming to meet you. And they wanted to know, first tell us a little bit about this book. What can we expect? So look, I think it's it's simplistically told. Um, I think I've kept the language very simple. I think it's also it's it's about entrepreneurship. It's not an autobiography, yeah. but it's filled with a lot of my anecdotes and my learning lessons. I think I've I've really uh, been very open and frank about my failures, which I think I've been many, and I've been kind of resilient about them. I think I've shared the fact that if you stay the course and if you really want to be an entrepreneur, I think one of my key lines there is it's not an outing; it's yeah. a journey. Yes. And from that perspective, you know, it's not something you can give a time-bound year that I'll give it two years, mm. because that's a recipe for failure. Right. Not everyone is cut out to be an entrepreneur, sure. but that doesn't mean that should dissuade you. Mm -hmm. And I think the fear of failure is just too big in this country. Yeah. And everyone just feels that at the end of it, that's the that's it. If you fail, means you fail. Except that it's almost a fear, right, of failure. Yeah. That, that yeah. So I think it deals with a lot of that. With that, with I think a lot of interesting anecdotes and learning lessons from my life. I love that. And in fact, I think there's a, a part in the book where you say uh, you're demystifying failure, as you said. Um, so how did you do that? What, what part, what, what are the lessons that you wish you could Well, do? you know, I think the first that you can start talking about failure, you start demystifying it 50% right. right there. Because people don't talk about that. So it's okay. It's okay. That it's things more than wrong. okay. Yeah. But first thing, I think everyone should be clear, you are going to fail. Yeah. <laughs> and yes. you are going to fail very often. So there's no question of the if out here. It's right. a question of when and how right. often. And but how most you, important, how you deal with it. I love that. Okay. Uh, and what's your first memory of success? What is the one aha moment you had when you're like, wait, I'm on to something? Well, I think it's an anecdote that I started with when I was living in Grand Road. My house was right opposite the Navati Cinema, right. uh, which at that time there was no television. So. Uh, the premieres for movies, uh, and co coincidentally, I didn't think at that stage, 20 years later, I'd be doing movies. Yeah. So there's absolutely no connection. Was really <coughs> those red carpet ones with massive spotlights and the roads being closed. Right. So our veranda was the only vantage point. And I, uh, I got out there and sold 15 to 20 tickets for people who wanted to watch the movie stars from there. So that was my first, what I would call, mini album for the moment. That's amazing. And if you could go back and give young 18-year-old Ronnie a piece of advice now, what would you go and tell him? Well, look, I think well, you've got to be able to first, I think 18 you're still young. Yeah. So people are looking for too many answers too early in life. Mm -hmm. And I think it's okay to keep changing your views on life. Yeah. Life evolves and I think that's one very important aspect. I think in India specifically, we're going to have not an opportunity for 10 million jobs to be created. Yeah. 
And I think therefore entrepreneurship should be as important as evangelized as running a professional career. Right. And thirdly, you can be a professional, but I think in the 21st century, even if you're working in a company as a professional, you need to be an entrepreneur that was gone in the days where you can feel all I need to do is a nine to five job. Sure. But how do you know you're cut out to be an entrepreneur? Like, are there some signs, you know, is there some sort of test you can take for no, yourself? No, I don't think there's a test you can yeah. take. I think it comes down to a lot, but most of it is the confidence that you have in yourself mm -hmm. and the clarity of thought. Most people think, unless I have a really good idea, I may not be an entrepreneur. Sure. A lot of people think, if I haven't got the funding and nobody's backing me, those are all byproducts. Those yeah. are means to the end. But if sure. you're very clear that this is what I, I can't visualize life without it, mm -hmm. this is what I think I want to do, and I'll stumble and I'll figure it out, but I'll stay with it, mm -hmm. that's the time when you're ready. I love, uh, you said that, you know, being an entrepreneur is about living, you know, having, taking the journey and living on your own terms. And uh, people always ask me because I'm, you know, running my own em empire and they always say, you know, where does work end and your life begin? And I always tell them it doesn't, it sort of crosses over. Yeah. And is that okay? And well, look, there are two aspects. One, I think it's phenomenal if you're blessed that what you love and what you're passionate about, which could easily have been your hobby, is also your profession. Sure. So, and that doesn't come to everybody. Yeah. So you need to be lucky about that. If it doesn't come to you, how much more you can bring joy at work mm -hmm. from that perspective, I think is the sort of balance that you would need to do. Yeah. But I would strongly advocate that work-life balance is something that you need to find your own on. Right. And it doesn't need to be in quotas. Yeah. It really doesn't need to be in quotas. Sure. My off time last year, somebody would ask me what did I do in my free time, I wrote a book. <laughs> that's okay, awesome. now somebody else would think that's a, that's a job, yeah, that's yeah. a work. To me that was yeah. very cathartic, very yeah. enjoyable, great sense of pride, yeah. really wanting to go back on. And hopefully, you know, if, if it does well, it'll yeah. be something of, of, of sort of inspiration to many people. Do you remember what, what was the first line you wrote of the book? You know, I actually got a co-author okay. uh, um, to write with me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I met a lot of people here in India, then I finally selected someone from the United States. Mm -hmm. And that's a little bit because of, I, I, in fi we sat down for four days, two days we just sat closet in a room yeah. and he gave me a brilliant structure and a simplicity of the tone of the language. Mm -hmm. So I think the first few lines he coined, Yeah. So the first draft, I think, was 50% his, 50% mine. By the time we came to the third draft, it was about 80% his, 20% his. So I think uh, if there was a first line, it would be the title. Mm -hmm. And the conversation was pretty much when he was trying to get me going, saying, so I'm going to write there that if you can dream it, you can do, do it, it yeah. kind of situation. And like I said, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I said, no, but I think you need to have your feet on the ground. And, you know, you've got to be aware and you need to keep yeah. your eyes open. So both yeah. of us clicked our finger and said, I think that could be the title. And I love that you did a, a cover launch. Very few people do that. So what was the thinking behind that? Well, I'll tell you. I think as soon as I sort of finished writing the book and I was sitting down with the publisher and he said, you know, non-fiction books, 40,000, 50,000, 60,000 copies, yeah. my face fell. Because I said, wait a minute, I haven't written this book for 60,000 people to only read it. I yeah. think I want much many more people to do that. And then I realized in my last 20 years in media and entertainment, anything that worked yeah. was not just about an idea wasn't how you executed it, it was equally important how you marketed it. Mm -hmm. And so I went about almost like a separate journey that says, look, if I'm writing a book on entrepreneurship, then I might as well go whole hog and might make this into an entrepreneurial journey yeah. as to how one marketed the book. And then my first objective was, I need to see how many people I can get to at least pick up the book. Yeah. Then whether they enjoy it, they don't enjoy it, they find something, they don't find something, it's up to them. Yeah. So I think from that perspective, there are many firsts as far as marketing for this book. I think the book launch is just the first yeah. of the first of them. And that's awesome. And I know uh, because we were at the big book launch, so we know that you sort of suggested a title for Ranbir's book. But for those <laughs> yeah. who weren't there, can you tell them what it is? Yeah, I think it was uh, Be Smart, Be Humble, or Be Humble, Be Smart in that order, whichever it was. I think Ranbir is a good listener, very good listener. Um, and he is. He's not humble just for the sake of being humble. Sure. And I think you can see that level of curiosity and listenership in him that makes him humble. Sure. So I just, it was off the cuff, it yeah. wasn't planned. But he owes you for that. <laughs> <laughs> if he writes the book and it this gets titled that way, yeah. So when you first finished college, just to take you back again, what did you think you were going to do? Did you have a dream in mind? You know, so I passed out of school. I was in cathedral school yeah. after I kind of moved out of Grand Tour and whatever else. And I was supremely confident. Yeah. bordering on arrogance <laughs> uh, and that's when I kind of flipped and went into the first year second year of college At that time you could jump a year in college oh, wow. uh, because if you did exceptionally well right. in your senior Cambridge or the, what, what that time lucky, was the yeah. standard well it, it, it turned out to be not so lucky because I jumped it yeah. and I think at that stage I was supremely confident nothing can go wrong and I failed that year okay so 
Now, for most people, and I think yeah. what would be shattering, because firstly, you let your parents down, and yeah. it's going to be on your CV for life. And I think that was the kind of moment, to a certain extent, the penny dropped, that, okay, so what if I don't have a CV? Yeah. If I, what if I don't have to have a CV? Then it won't haunt me, right? Yeah. So why don't I do something my own where I don't ever need a CV? Wow, that's so interesting. I would never imagine so it came out from. A yeah, I think I think yeah. Like I'm coining it in a more interesting way, but I think pretty much that's how the thought flew. And you're ranked among the most 100 most influential people in the world according to Time 100. So what's the secret? None. I think these. Uh, I think uh, I just want to say that all of these numberings and <laughs> top this and top that are just nice at that moment in time. They sure. somebody sat in a room and discussed names and picked it up. Yeah. It's not a lottery, so I think it's a nice feeling. Yeah. But you know, it doesn't go anywhere. There are tons and tons of people doing incredible stuff in this world. And uh, I'm sure people would love to know who do you look up to and admire? Like a book that you you know that you've been inspired by, nonfiction or or a personality. I have been asked that and I have to say actually none, I haven't been able to draw that and I'm not being arrogant nor am I being supremely humble, I'm just trying to say <laughs> that it hasn't. So yeah. situations and circumstances have always got to me, mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise not so really. I think sometimes when I draw my one-liners, it's from uh, General Patton, okay. from a movie called Patton or something like that, but otherwise from books point of view, yeah. uh, no, I think it's been more situations. So when I think when we started off home shopping, mm -hmm. uh, the fact of what Walmart and Sam Walton had done in US with his chain yeah. was an inspiration then for me to think about my home shopping here. Mm -hmm. But you know, and I think to many aspects in media one would draw circumstances, but no individual. Right. And uh, we're in the social media generation. So, you know, we get really excited when a celebrity tweets us. Is there any personality on Twitter that you'd be excited to get a tweet from? Ah, huh, that's a good one. Uh, well, I think President Obama. Yeah, that would be <laughs> right. amazing, right? Okay. Uh, President Obama, Bill okay. Gates, and uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi. I think, uh, frankly, I think Mr. Modi is doing a phenomenal job because I think he's drawing out inspiration, ambition of levels of people and he's giving, I think a leader's job is to communicate and to inspire and I think yeah. to that extent he's doing a great job. And he's so good, he's on Viber, on Instagram, he's pretty yeah. much everywhere. <laughs> is there a quality that entrepreneurs need to have that should have? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of them, mm -hmm. it's a lot of them, but that doesn't mean, that sh that's not in a scary tone, uh, but I think it's, firstly, I think it's a lot to do with the guts. Mm -hmm. Got, you've got to have that clarity of thought and you've got to have the gumption and the guts. You've got to have a risk-taking ability and not risk in a silly manner, but risk in a positive manner. Yeah. Risk in a manner that you're going to be disruptive, you are going to challenge the constant and you're going to move forward. So I think all of those is one aspect there. I think the second part is communication and culture. It's very, very critical, very, very important. If you're not a great communicator, you've got to figure out how to be. It's not a cross it's not like, oh, I need to be an elocution expert. You don't need to be. Mm -hmm. I think I've been fortunate because I pursued theater as a hobby. Oh, nice. And I think if, I, if that's the one, tri uh, what I got from that hobby was an incredible le level of confidence that I think has seen me through the rest of my life. And you got to really want it too, right? you got to really be hungry. you got to be hungry. hungry. Um, is there a favorite book or movie quote that you always refer to? I I, yeah, I think there's one uh, that I use pretty often, which is all glory is fleeting. <laughs> Um, and I really believe in the fact that all glory is fleeting. I think in 20 years in media, it teaches you all glory is fleeting. <laughs> uh, but I think overall, that's really what it is. It just keeps you sense that the today and now is here. But it also kind of, I've been accused a lot by being not someone who celebrates too many things. And people feel in an organization, you just okay. celebrate the small things and the big things. And I agree. Yeah. Uh, and I think because of my strong thought process that all really glory is fleeting, it's always like, okay, fine, but now next, let's get to the next one. This happened yesterday, let's move on to the next one. <laughs> all right, so if I stole your iPod or whatever you listen to music on, what song would I find most played? Classical. Oh, really? Yeah. Very interesting. Okay. Yeah. I think because it kind of, uh, it's a, it, it kind of adds and soothes, and at the same time, I think it kind of, for me, it's inspiration. It gets me going. And when you were younger, what's one thing that you <coughs> craved that you wanted? Was it a particular car or like at that time I had a numerical pager so there weren't really cell phones, but something you really craved and then you finally got for yourself? Yeah, well, difficult. I think I craved would be tough. Mm -hmm. I think some of the hobbies that I pursued and I think again, you know, yeah. just the plays and the theater that we did was, was huge because for us it was everything that we did in life. Yeah. Um, I don't think in any 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 piece of article that I was really aspirational about. No. What? Maybe I was I have a huge sweet tooth. So. Oh really? <laughs> oh, I should have brought you cupcakes. <laughs> what uh, what plays did you do? I'm curious to know. 
So I think some of the memorable ones were in school, just when I passed out, was Taming the Shrew, um, uh, very, very Shakespearean, etc. And then, then my, one of my most memorable ones is the play called Children of a Lesser, Children of a Lesser God. It's a two people play really with a few other characters, but the, 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 the lead is a, is a school teacher and he's got a hearing impaired and speech impaired uh, student. Uh, and so the whole play is almost like a soliloquy because I've, firstly I've got to learn the sign language. She's only talking in the sign language. So I'm talking my lines to the audience and, and then I'm interpreting her lines to the audience as we go across. So I think it taught me a lot of discipline, a lot of focus in life. And um, yeah, and a lot of confidence. Do you remember the sign language? Yeah, I remember any do, sign language. Can you do the dream with your well, eyes like, open? Why don't you uh, dream with your eyes open? I love that. That's <laughs> awesome. Okay, and last two questions. What do you think of this internet generation? The second, you know, the first dot com bubble burst, and now everyone is back. No, I don't think this first dot com bubble burst. I think the valuations. I think the, the, the investor community overpaid yeah. and they've got equally as much to blame and less for the entrepreneurs who you put a silver platter in front of them with chocolates, they're going to eat it and if they're complimentary chocolates, you're going to eat it more. Yeah. So I don't think that there was a bubble then, the bubble was created. I think today as you look at e-commerce, internet here, etc., it's not. Who would have thought three years, four years back people in India would be shopping online to the level at which they are and not things that that are just books and phones, but even things that you can touch and feel. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think everyone's waiting for that bandwidth. So you've got you've got people at all levels of strata of society uh, looking at mobile. So I think we're going to leapfrog a lot. Yeah. I don't think it's a bubble. I think the the bubble is only in some of the valuations, but that's neither here nor there. That will find its own. Water will find its own level at one stage. Yeah. And here's a question in from Vivek who says, um, you have. Uh, you, you have a family and commitments and you want to change the world from his perspective. Some advice, how do you do both? Well, you do both. Uh, yeah. And I think, again, I've been very, very blessed because uh, Zarina is uh, very, very active in the Swadesh Foundation, more than I am. Yeah. So it, for us, it's complete teamwork. And my daughter, Trisha, actually went and studied for eight years abroad and finished a post-graduation in film at the best film school in the world, which is USC came back, did one documentary, and then walked in and said, I don't think I want to do media, I don't want to do it at all. <laughs> and I started our own NGO. Oh, wow. So I think we've got, in this office, three rooms, one next to the other, everyone looking at social more than anything else. Amazing. So I think that's worked well. And Brown Boy says, you've been an incredible inspiration right from the crowdfunding days, and they're looking forward to the book, so a message out there for you. Great. And last, what, what is the best piece of advice anyone ever gave you? Huh, I think it's multiple advices that may have come from time to time. Um, but I would say when I was six, seven or eight, it wasn't advice. But I was trying to learn swimming at the cricket club of India. <coughs> yeah. And my coach was trying to teach me swimming for the fourth day and wasn't succeeding. <laughs> and my dad just picked me up and threw me in the pool. Oh and you know, and I think I kind of went up and down, went up and down, finally came up. And you know, what looked like eternity was must be about seven or eight seconds. And I was okay, and from then on I started to swim. But I think I learned some quick lesson lessons then. First, that my dad was supremely confident <laughs> that you know something or the other was going to do because he wasn't in the swim costume. He was fully clothed at that particular so point in time, so he wasn't coming for an SOS. Um, and the second one for me was a, a lesson that says you can figure out all your fears, but at the end of the day, you'll find a solution if you're really confident. If you really figure out what you want to do, you'll figure it out. And cut to many, many, many years later, my daughter was about three years old. I was in the Bombay gym pool reading a book and I just put the book down and I could see her just walking into the pool and dropping in and plunk in there. So I dived after her, picked her up and put her out and I thought, oh my God, now she's never going to swim again in her life. And then an hour later I took her back into the pool and she was absolutely fine because she couldn't remember that. But I realized later when we were talking to a couple of doctors, whatever, they said the best thing you did was an hour later you took her back in the water. Because I think anyone who remembers that kind of acute failure can sort of mark scar you for life. But if you can learn to deal with it in and around that time, she's that scuba diving. I don't even I don't even go snorkeling. That's incredible. I think that's some really great advice there. Thank you so much for spending time with us, Ronnie. It was so interesting chatting with you and we cannot wait to read this book. I'm especially excited because I'm a young entrepreneur in Bombay and it's one of those things where it just gives everyone hope and you know it inspires us to do the best that we can. Well, I do. hope so. I hope it does. Thank and you. And we shall be dreaming with our eyes open, and so should you. Hi, I'm Ronnie Skruwala. You're watching MissMalini.com. Dream with your eyes open. Miss Mali
Miss Malini's World with Miss Malini. Miss Malini. Miss Malini's World. Miss Malini's World on DLC. Yeah.